The Ray Hanania Show is brought to you by the U.S. Arab Radio Network. Listen to live radio every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern in Detroit, Washington, D.C., New York, and Ontario, Canada. Or watch the live broadcast on Facebook.com forward slash Arab News. The Ray Hanania Show is rebroadcast in Chicago at 12 noon on Thursday. For more information on the radio stations, live Facebook broadcast, and podcasts, visit ArabNews.com. And now, here's your host, columnist and U.S. Special Correspondent for Arab News, Ray Hanania. I am your host, Ray Hanania. We're broadcasting live in Detroit, Washington, D.C. Today, we're going to get updates on what's happening at the United Nations General Assembly 77th session. The UNGA 77 opened on September 13th amid deepening global crisis and major world challenges. In our first segment, we're going to speak with Iranian dissident Ms. Ramesh Separad, who discusses the presence of the Iran regime president Ibrahim Raisi, who addresses the UN General Assembly. Why is this pariah being allowed to speak to the world and not being held accountable for the massacres he orchestrated in 1988 a political dissidents who were being held in prison already. Many of them were being released, but instead were killed. Um, Ms. Separad is an author and a scholar and Iran specialist. She's the chairperson on the advisory board of the Organization of Iranian American Communities with 40 chapters. Um, in segment two, we're going to speak with Med Global founder, president, and refugee advocate Dr. Zahar Sahalul, who discusses the growing Syrian refugee crisis and what the UN needs to do about it. Dr. Sahalul is a Syrian American critical care specialist from Chicago. Med Global is an organization that provides health care in disaster regions, and he is also the founder of the American Relief Coalition for Syria and Syria Faith Initiative. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll begin our interviews. We'll be right back, right after these messages. Are your hands feeling numb? Do you feel pain opening up a jar, turning a key? Are you noticing that your elbow and your shoulder are becoming stiff, or were you recently injured in your arm? Hello, I'm Dr. Albajit Katranji, and at the Katranji Hand Center, which just recently opened down the street from the Somerset Mall, we can provide you with the latest in hand, wrist, elbow, and shoulder care. Visit us at www.katranjihandcenter.com to learn the latest techniques that we have to offer you, and I look forward to taking care of you. Visit us in Troy at 1565 West Big Beaver Road, Building F, or call Katranji Hand Center for an appointment at 248-869-4263. That's 248-869-4263. As we continue to face COVID-19, we're now facing flu season. Influenza has the potential to infect millions, putting lives and the healthcare system at risk. Now more than ever, it's essential to protect yourself from influenza by getting the flu vaccine. The flu vaccine is safe and effective and can't give you the flu. To protect yourself and those at highest risk, get your flu vaccine. Learn more at michigan.gov flu. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Get ready for an amazing experience at Ishtar Restaurant on 15 Mile Road in Sterling Heights. Enjoy excellent hospitality from owners Ali al-Baghdadi and Fatty Bottom serving the best in Mediterranean food. Try Chef Ali al-Baghdadi's famous shawarma, the best Iraqi grills and food, and the best Arabic and international dishes. Dine in our authentic atmosphere or take out. Call 586-698-2585 or check us out on Facebook. Ishtar Restaurant practices all CD guidelines and is open every day 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. Have an amazing experience today at Ishtar Restaurant, 3625 15 Mile Road, Sterling Heights. I'm really honored and uh, excited to uh, welcome our guest, uh, Ms. Ramesh Separad, to our program here at the Ray Hanania Show. Uh, Ms. Separad, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thanks for having me. And your activism, your writing, um, it's just uh, very extensive. And if there's anybody that we need to talk to about what's happening at the UN and what's uh, happening with Iran, I think you're one of the perfect people. You've been recommended by so many people uh, in the uh, pro-democracy Iran movement uh, that uh, I follow. Um, Tell us just a, a little bit about yourself, just for our listeners. You know, um, you know, why, 
your background and your family. Tell us, are, are you uh, a, a, an expatriate of Iran? Were you chased out? Give us a little summary of your own personal experience. Sure. I think um, like many of us uh, who have come here to the United States, uh, we all have faced the uh, oppression and the persecution by the current Iranian regime. My family actually has a very unique story, story because of the fact that uh, they were also under the persecution and oppression from the previous regime, the Shah. My uncle was a former political prisoner under the Shah. He was severely tortured. And of course, uh, even though we had the 1979 revolution with the hope of having democracy, uh, when Khomeini came to Iran, he um, he essentially established a theocracy and, and committed um, heinous crimes in the name of Islam. He used uh, uh, Islam as a weapon against uh, the people of Iran. And um, my family members, uh, including my mother, my father, my uh, teenage sister, actually, um, they were all uh, arrested by the regime. My, my sister was a student activist. She was 14 when she was arrested. And um, my mother was an activist among the mother's community. Uh, she was uh, actually a cancer patient when she was arrested. So it really was a difficult situation. We were also among the lucky ones that we were able to um, get away, you know, get my relatives were released and we were able to get away from Iran and, and uh, come and settle in US, um, although I was very young at the time, but you have to kind of remember where you come from. You can't really forget what you see there right. because what took place 40 some years ago to, uh, and happened to my family, it's still happening today. It's still going on and it's gotten worse. And it's no longer just going after people that are uh, supporters of Iran's main opposition group, the MEK, is also touching the average uh, citizen, whether it's on the political oppression, uh, social oppression, religious oppression, or, or even just the ethnic groups in Iran that are facing tremendous um, oppression and, and uh, persecution by the Iranian regime. So I think uh, if you kind of look at my personal story to what's happening across Iran, you only get a very, very small window. And I think the message is uh, the people of Iran continue to resist, continue not to give up, continue to uh, uh, push back on this regime. Yes, it has taken a while. It has taken more than four decades, but we are now reaching a very, very pivotal moment where uh, the regime is very weak. The regime is very desperate, and that's why you see when it comes to the issue of nuclear, um, they can't even come to a negotiation agreement with the, with the U.S., regardless of how much incentives have been rolled out for them. So, so I think uh, I think that is the real story uh, beyond just our personal stories on what's happening in Iran today. I, I know that uh, I've covered the United Nations General Assembly in the past. And the largest protests have always been the uh, pro-democracy Iranian protesters. You bring a lot of people. It's very diverse, as you point out, this movement. It isn't just one segment. It's a lot of people. Um, and tell us about what's happening with them. Um, what Absolutely. will people see? And I know we're we're speaking, you know, we're, as our listeners know, I pre-taped this. So we're speaking a couple days before... Uh, you know, when this airs on Wednesday. So, but what, what can people expect um, from the protests and, and when is the big day? Sure. So we actually have launched uh, a week long campaign against Ibrahim Raisi, Iran's president, who is scheduled to speak at the UN General Assembly on Wednesday. Um, and and you're absolutely right, Ray. I think um, the coalition of the Iran's opposition group, which is the National Council of Resistance of Iran, uh, always brings uh, very diverse, very robust, very active members of the Iranian community, the Iranian diaspora uh, to the streets because they are the one that have the most credibility at the table because they are the one that have the most uh, clear platform in terms of what does the future of Iran holds. For example, Mrs. Rajavi, Marim Rajavi, the um, president-elect of the coalition has a 10-point plan and in that 10 point plan, it talks about a non-nuclear secular republic, um, peaceful coexistence uh, with the neighbors, gender equality, everything that the Iranian people envision and you see it and you hear it in their daily protests inside Iran is reflected in her 10 point plan. For So from that perspective, 
uh, this coalition is is quite um, uh, supported, popular among the Iranian diaspora, and and, and obviously you could extrapolate from there uh, inside Iran. Uh, and 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 they have very very strong network inside Iran. In fact, the resistance unit inside Iran continues to grow year over year. Um, I think uh, with com comparing just 2022 to the previous year, I think it was um, it grew fivefold um, across all of uh, main cities and towns in Iran, and they continue to network. Uh, with the broader segment of Iranian society and representing the student uh, students, women, especially teachers union, labor movement, uh, really a very like, retired pensioners, very strong um, representation from all sector of the society that are networked with the resistance unit. So, so I think it's only natural to expect them to have the largest turnout uh, because this is the group that also has paid the heavy price. You know, Ibrahim Raisi himself is responsible for um, what we call the 1988 massacre of uh, political prisoners in the summer of 1988. Um, 30,000 political prisoners were uh, executed under Khomeini's fatwa, and Raisi was part of the death commission. So, uh, so Raisi is directly responsible and, and engaged was engaged in in crimes against humanity and and genocide. So this year in particular in our rally, uh, we're looking to not only hold the Iranian regime accountable, but more Im importantly, hold Raisi accountable. There is a legal case against Raisi. More than sixteen plaintiffs, um, including uh, survivors of the eighty eight massacre, witnesses, relatives, and families of the victims. Uh, that have brought charges against Raisi. That case is now being brought uh, to hearing on um, November 15th in the Southern District um, uh, Court of New York. So I think uh, above and beyond just the pro-democracy campaign that we have, we also have a campaign or for accountability, campaign for holding the Iranian criminal uh, leaders uh, accountable for their human rights violations for crimes against humanity and also for their ongoing uh, campaign of terrorism, both at home and abroad. Um, I'm sure you heard about the story of Mahsa Amini, a young girl who was um, essentially uh, taken in by what they call police um, that was essentially giving her a hard time because of her dress code. And uh, she was beaten so severely in custody that by the time she was taken to the hospital, she had um, a massive brain injury, which unfortunately led to her, her death. And uh, what's heartbreaking about this situation is this is not the first case and unfortunately probably won't be the last case. And, uh, but what's interesting is um, the way that her family is essentially not allowing the regime to whitewash their, their crime. She comes from the Great. city of San Andaj and, and that city has been in unrest and uprising since uh, two days ago, since uh, Mahsa was buried. Uh, the Iranian regime, of course, cuts off the internet trying to prevent the news from getting out, but the news is getting out um, and, and that's uh, the strikes and the protests is now spreading across Iran. And we, of course, uh, declare our, our solidarity in our upcoming rally in New York against Ibrahim Raisi with the people of Iran that are currently protesting in the streets, men, women, and children. Um, Iran's Tehran's university today had a rally where um, they were essentially calling for accountability. So the momentum, the gaining momentum from both inside Iran and outside Iran is coming to head together. And, and we're very, very hopeful that uh, Iranian people will see change, will see meaningful change of a regime that is authentic, it's fomented and is fostered uh, from domestically by the people of Iran, by the resistance movement, and it does have a clear platform on what the future of Iran holds, which is what I referred to in my previous remarks that uh, Mrs. Rajavi is what we hoping that would essentially transition Iran into a democracy for us. I, I have so many questions about what you just said. Uh... Uh, one of them is uh, the the did they take the case or have they thought about taking 
uh, that case from the 1988 uh, massacre of these uh, political prisoners. I mean, they're prisoners. And then to kill them, yeah. it seems to me it is a war crime. Did they Absolutely. bring that to the International Criminal Court at the UN? Have they brought that to that level or is it just in the U.S. District Court? There has been actually legal cases across different countries. For example, in Sweden, under the universal jurisdiction, one of the lower level culprits, uh, Hamid Nouri, he was arrested in Sweden and he actually got the um, his case was uh, sentenced and he got the maximum sentence. Um, the, this, there's been other cases in UK and now the case in US. You know, I do foresee this to become like a culminating campaign in order to go into the ICC because you're absolutely right. I mean, this is a war crime. And and to make matters worse, Ray, some of the political prisoners were actually, they had already finished their sentences and they had already um, were, should have been released, but the regime held them based on the fatwa that Khomeini issued. And their, Raisi was among the death committee that essentially asked them, would you denounce uh, the MEK? And, and 90% of the victims, by the way, were members of the Iran's main opposition group, Mujahideen Khal, MEK. And, and, and that the, was in, that was the opposition group in the country. In the country, exactly. And they're still in the country, obviously. And, and they still have uh, significant support outside of Iran. And, um, but, you know, it was a simple question, will you de- denounce the MEK? And the, if the answer to that question was no, then those prisoners would uh, face um, uh, execution. So I think it really tells you the a couple of things. One is the brutal nature of this regime, that how fearful it is from its main opposition group. They really do view MEK as its existential threat. But then the other thing is the resiliency of the MEK. I think the regime really thought that by completely executing a majority of its members, they were already in prison uh, through this heinous crime. They could put an end to the message of democracy and freedom that this group brings to the table. But to, uh, on the contrary, their message continues to grow, continue to, to flourish, and now it resonates with today's generation. And that's why I was referring to the resistance unit. Uh, all of those young people that are joining the MEK's resistance unit they were born after the 1988 uh, massacre. So I think it really tells you that that uh, that symbolic message that those people that chose in that pivotal moment to say no to this regime was actually critical for the continuation of the pro-democracy movement in Iran. And we see that uh, right now in the streets of Iran as people are shouting down with the dictator, down with Raisi and Khamenei. So again, um, the message is a message of not mourning those who have gone, but celebrating what they stood for and and also really honoring uh, their sacrifice in our today's movement for democracy. Raisi's regime, uh, the Iranian regime, has been involved in so many acts of uh, not just terrorism, but targeting of uh, uh, dissidents, not just in Iran, but throughout the world. Is there a concern that, you know, allowing Raisi to speak at the United Nations opens the door to this idea for them that they have no bounds, that they could do something? I mean, is there a safety factor that needs to be addressed here regarding, you know, people who speak out against this terrible regime here, even in the United States. You know, you're absolutely right. Regimes, terrorism record, regimes, uh, human rights record really speaks for itself. But I think one thing we have to be very clear that we're not going to let their dictatorial, their inhumane uh, policy of just kind of a mafia style killing and 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 uh, intimidation uh, stop our campaign for democracy. At the end of the day, the message for the UN is that you must end impunity. You must hold Iranian regimes accountable. You know, I think it's a real insult to the to the Charter of the United Nations to allow someone as as um, brutal and as criminal as Raisi to use that venue for its uh, for its agenda. Uh, ultimately, I think the people of Iran. 
uh, are the real owners of the Iranian seat at the UN. And I think the real message of Iran is going to be heard in our rally on Wednesday, uh, where thousands of people are coming together. And uh, that's the real message that the UN leaders should be listening to and the international community should be uh, essentially heeding to their demand and their um, ask for ending impunity, holding Raisi accountable. In fact, um, uh, expelling Raisi, uh, I, I do welcome and I do foresee people will walk out as soon as Raisi will take uh, his, um, will take the podium. And that is the minimum. That is absolutely the minimum that the, the world leaders should do on that day. But I think more importantly, we expect to have President Biden to denounce Raisi's criminal act, including the killing of Mahsa in the last several days. You know, since Raisi took office, there's been more than 600 executions in Iran. And he's only been in office for August, actually marked his one year anniversary as Iran's president. So I think, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no. Uh, do you think that the uh, uh, we see conflicts like this in I many areas? There's the Israel-Palestine conflict. Um, and although Israel is a member of the United Nations, the United Nations has recognized the Palestinians and given them a presence at the United Nations. Have they done, has the United Nations stepped up to recognize the role of Iranian dissidents who are challenging this brutal uh, regime in Iran, do you have recognition at the that you know is, the same is, level? Uh, well, it should be. I mean, uh, NCR, the National Council of Resistance, as far as we are concerned, it is a parliament in exile, and they should be recognized by the UN, and they should be, in fact, be given the alternative voice to the people of Iran instead of the the brutal regime and a terrorist regime whose only agenda is to acquire nuclear weapon. And 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 cause mayhem and and uh, you know establish its hegemonic role in the Middle East. So um, I think this is absolutely the minimum that the UN can do in recognizing uh, the parliament in exile. And I think more importantly, recognizing the right of the Iranian people to overthrow this regime. We, the people of Iran, preserve and deserve the right to overthrow this regime. And, and we will. It's not that uh, the people of Iran are waiting for these types of recognition to continue their campaign, but it is a test of time. It is a question for the world leaders to actually make a decision to stand on the right side of the history with the people of Iran and its rightful uh, resistance, the National Council of Resistance versus the ceremonial um, standing by the uh, brutal regime uh, and people like Raisi who is going to be using the UN uh, podium for its sinister agenda. There have been so many protests about uh, uh, Iran's uh, uh, regime's leader, uh, Ibrahim Raisi, speaking at the UN. Um, and there are many calls. I mean, I know the NCRI and uh, at several of their uh, recent conferences urged the U United States not to allow this war, uh, you know, war criminal to speak and address the United Nations. Obviously, that didn't happen. Do you think the people in the West, uh, for example, the Americans, I know that you're not, this isn't a criticism of Americans or the American leadership, but do they really understand the depth of the uh, evil that Raisi's government represents, you know, in Iran? Do they actually understand how dangerous, you know, this government is? And why haven't they turned to the dissidents and said, you need to be there at the UN. You should have a seat at the UN. Uh, you should be a speaker. If Raisi could speak yeah. at the UN, why shouldn't the leader, Mrs. Rajavi, or leaders of the NCRI or the MEK, why shouldn't they be given the opportunity to speak? These are very good questions. These are excellent questions for the UN officials, for the US government to be asked of. And I think, you know, one thing that really is very heartwarming for us is the support of the US Congress. And I must insist, it is a bipartisan support. Uh, we do have a very strong bipartisan support who, who came together, 52 members of Congress came together, calling up President Biden not to allow Raisi to come to United States. And um, and I think 
um, you know, various events and campaigns that we've had really does bring the message here to America for the American public to see that um, as the photo exhibits that we had, um, several days of photo exhibit by US Congress that we had uh, last month, really putting racist crimes on display. As we speak right now, Ray, today and tomorrow, by the UN in Dog Hammers Court, in the same location where we're going to be having thousands of people joining us for a rally on Wednesday, we are hosting a photo exhibit of thousands of victims who have been killed by racy. And I'm talking men, women, and children. So, yeah. so as far as the awareness campaign, as far as uh, public reach out, and as far as our message is concerned, I think it's very, very clear. In fact, I'm reminded of the interview that Racy did uh, with 60 Minutes last night, where um, he was asked about uh, the massacre of the political prisoners. And he had, Racy had the audacity to call these prisoners terrorists. These are the people that are part of the Iran's opposition. They were already in prison. He still defends his crime and he calls them a terrorist. When he's asked about uh, killing American officials um, because of um, the actions that United States took against Qasem Soleimani, he defended the fact that the, there is an active terror plot against government officials and dissidents. So I think uh, from the when it comes to the Iranian regime, their nature is very clear. Their actions are very cr clear. Their crimes are recorded. We know where they are. So when it comes to the you know, international legal uh, bodies and international officials and, and policymakers, the path to take a position on Raisi is very, very clear. And as I said, I'm very, very happy that a U.S. Congress in a bipartisan fashion has been leading that effort. But I think uh, the administration can benefit from taking the lead and taking the uh, message from U.S. Congress and, and really embolden this campaign by leading an international campaign to hold Raisi accountable. And that effort can actually start when President Biden is going to take the podium, speaking in the same venue that Raisi is going to be speaking, and, and really be very clear with his message on uh, what United States stands for, which is on the issue of human rights and democracy. We must be very, very clear with our message with Iran. And I want to ask this question, not as a criticism of Biden, but as a focus on the policy, regardless of who the leadership is. Um, why is it that the United States has allowed this, uh, what many people call a charade for the JCPOA to continue? It, it's almost as if it's a joke. I mean, when you look at this, it's been going on and on. I remember months ago, they said, they were warning that, you know, the Iranians are close to building a nuclear weapon. We need to get this done right away. And it's clear that Iran's regime is using this as a cover, you know, to delay, to get what they want and achieve their goal. Do you think that they are really taking these negotiations seriously or are they exploiting the lack of will of the West? And again, I'm not criticizing President Biden but maybe he's not being tough enough. He needs to be tougher. No, I think, um, you know, it's funny. I was reading this survey uh, recently that even Democrats are not happy with uh, president's performance when it comes to dealing with Iran. So this is not uh, a, a partisan issue. This should be a bipartisan um, united front in, in confronting in Iran's uh, nuclear threats. You know, to be honest, the way I kind of view the last several, well, almost a uh, um, year and a half um, in negotiations with the Iranian regime is nothing short of an appeasement. We have yeah. been appeasing the Iranian regime. And the, the, the fact is that Iran takes appeasement as a sign of weakness on the part of the United States. And we have been saying all along, only a firm policy will work with this tyrannical regime in Tehran, whether it was Raisi in the office or Rouhani in the office or whoever was in the office. This has been our message from day one. And I think when it comes to the real path forward, we should be taking our cues from the people of Iran who want this regime gone. The people of Iran are denouncing this regime. 
They want this regime changed. They're very, very clear on how they want this regime changed. They're not looking for American boots on the ground. They're not looking for money. They are looking for political recognition of their rights to overthrow this regime. Whether the United States is going to wake up to this reality or not, that remains to be seen. But the fact is the Iranian people are going to do what they're going to do is to change the regime by themselves. Now, when it comes to the U.S. interests, national interests, yes, not making sure that Iran does not get its hands on nuclear weapon falls within the U.S. national interest. And the only way to get there is to be tough on Iran, not to come, to have these endless talks that essentially is going to buy time for the regime until it's done with its full weaponization programs. So from, from that perspective, I think the sooner the United States could get tough on Iran, the better it is for the world peace, and the better it is for the sake of history on standing on the right side of the uh, of the history with the people of Iran. And just a final question. And, and again, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this interview. Um, this is one of the tragic stories that I don't think enough has been done, not by the dissidents, but by the supporters who should be stepping up and doing more. And one of those fronts is at the United Nations. It's not enough to condemn terrorism and violence, um, but they should give you a seat. They should allow you to be able to face face to face with that regime um, in a situation like this and and respond uh, to whatever he says. I mean, other nations, like you said, uh, I'm hoping that President uh, Biden, again, we're taping early, addresses the need to do something. But what else can the United Nations do, do you think? What steps can they take to bring about a resolution, an end to this terrorism, an end to a regime that abuses its people? Are they doing enough and what more could they do? No, they're not doing enough. I think when it comes to the to the issue of nuclear, I think all of the UN Security Council resolutions should come back to its to force. They should be reinstated. I think um, when it comes to the human rights, they should be a very strong uh, um, censuring of the Iranian regime for its ongoing human rights violations. As I said, 600 people have been executed in less than a year on the Raisi's watch. And I think there should be a very, very specific resolution on Raisi himself and the 1988 massacre. You know, more than 400 UN uh, former officials and uh, you know, jurists and, and legal experts have come together and signed a declaration and called on UN to initiate uh, a full investigation into the 1988 uh, massacre and the role of the Iranian officials in that massacre. It hasn't gone anywhere. And I think this is something wow. that the Secretary General should take up on and, and uh, really initiate that investigation uh, because of the fact that the Iranian regime is actually destroying the mass graves of where uh, these victims have been buried. And it is Amnesty International has issued a message on this and, and, and everyone is saying we're losing time. Iran is trying to, they're going beyond just disguising and denying this ever happened, but they're also destroying the evidence. So time is of the essence. I think there is a lot more that the UN can do. There are definitely a lot more in there at their disposal on many different issues, not just human rights and the 88 massacre, but also on the nuclear side that the UN can lead and can do. And I'm hoping that um, as the leaders take podium in the upcoming sessions on the UN General Assembly, they would be calling for that. And because we will be outside calling for that. And, and to your point, uh, the real alternative voice or the real voice of the Iranian people is what's happening outside of UN on Wednesday, calling for freedom and democracy in Iran. So that's what we're hoping that it gets reflected and echoed by some of the member states at the UN General Assembly. My guest, I've been very honored to be speaking with Iranian dissident and author and writer, uh, Ms. Ramesh Separad. Um, she is an author and scholar with multiple universities focused on conflict resolution and cybersecurity and an Iran specialist. Um, and even as she explained to us her experience of her family, um, that just terrible that, you know, what your family went through. She is the chairperson on the advisory board 
of the Organization of Iranian American Communities, which has 40 chapters. Uh, Ms. Sheparad, thank you so much for joining us on radio. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Ray. It was great to be with you. And we're going to take another break. And when we come back, we will be speaking with uh, Dr. Zahar Sahlul right after these this break. So we'll be right back right after these messages. Enjoy the first Syrian-style cuisine in Michigan. At Davos Cuisine and Catering, you'll find a wide selection of Syrian foods and sweets in our menu, like frike, hoisi, grape leaves with steak, mashawi platter, hot mahashi, char-grilled kebab, shawarma, and much more. Get super-fast delivery from Damas Cuisine and Catering right to your door. Order online at damascuisine.com forward slash menu and track your order live. Damas Cuisine and Catering, 28841 Orchard Lake Road in Farmington Hills. Call 248-987-4985. Ziad Brand, quality products from our family to yours. Ziad Brothers Importing offers the finest quality products, including brands like Sultan, Kraft, Nestle, Hook, Rico Picon, Donna, and many more. Ask your retailer to carry these fine products because you deserve the very best. For more information, visit our website at www.ziad.com. That's www.ziad.com. Ziad, quality products from our family to yours. Life is a nonprofit charity that's provided humanitarian aid and development to people and communities for over 25 years, regardless of race, color, religion, or cultural background. When disaster occurs here or around the world, Life for Relief and Development rushes in to provide food, medical aid, and shelter to those in need. Please help improve these efforts. Make your tax-deductible donation to Life now at lifeusa.org or call 248-424-7493. Welcome to the program, Dr. Sahul. It's always a pleasure to have you on this radio show. I, I mean it. The insight you bring about refugees really helps to educate everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Ray. Thank you for having me. I'm really uh, honored to be again uh, on your show. I wish one day we wouldn't have to call on you and we wouldn't have any refugee crisis a- around the world, but it it seems like it's getting worse, not better. Give us, Tell us what's the status uh, for Syrian refugees and refugees in general, what what's happening? Uh, as as you've mentioned, uh, unfortunately, um, uh, the refugee crisis, the global refugee crisis, is getting worse by the day. Um, every day, you have thousands of refugees fleeing um, oppression, fleeing brutality of wars, fleeing uh, climate change uh, and floods and uh, natural disasters, of course economic and governance deterioration in countries in Africa and the Middle East and the Southeast Asia, uh, and now in Europe with the Ukrainian, uh, with the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine, where you have uh, suddenly, within a few months, uh, 6 million Ukrainian refugees. Wow. So right now, there are about 28, 29 million refugees in the world. Um, many of them uh, came from countries that are going through wars, um, whether it's um, wars with other countries or um, civil wars, including Syria. Uh, There is still 6.5 million Syrian refugees. Um, One out of four refugees in the world um, are from Syria or is from Syria, still after 11 years of crisis. Most of the Syrian refugees are located in countries that are neighboring Syria. Lebanon has one million refugees, Syrian refugees. That means one out of uh, five people in Lebanon um, is a Syrian refugee. Um, Jordan has about 650,000 Syrian refugees. Iraq has about 300,000 Syrian refugees. Turkey has the largest number of Syrian refugees, about 4 million Syrian refugees. Egypt, uh, I mean, I I, I thought that the number of Syrian refugees are about 200,000. I was told by uh, the Egyptian counselor in, in, in Chicago recently that their estimate of the Syrian refugees in Egypt is 1.5 million wow. Syrian refugees living in Egypt. Of course, there is 1 million refugees in, in Germany and Sweden, other European countries. Our country here, the United States, took only 25,000 Syrian refugees to be resettled, which is a very small number out of the large number of Syrian refugees. The things in Syria are not going well as for people who are following the news. So for a refugee who's been in Lebanon and treated as a third-class citizen with all of this 
anti-refugee sentiment or in Turkey or other places, they have still no no place to go back to. I mean, for a refugee to go back to their country, they three conditions have to be satisfied according to the parameters of the United Nations Refugee Organization, UNSCR. First of all, the, the, the return has to be voluntary. That means no one would force it, should force you to go back to a country where you were persecuted or your family were killed or your house was bombed or you're fleeing oppression and torture or chemical weapons like what's happening in Syria. Second thing, that it should be dignified. I mean, when you go back to your country, there is a house, uh, there is a job for you, there is proper education, no one will persecute you. Um, so there should be some dignity in your return. The third thing, it should be safe. That means you will not be killed by the same authorities that you uh, have fled from. You will not be uh, put in the prison and then disappear in the prison, like what happened in, in hundreds of Syrian refugees who returned back forcefully or because of the pressure on them. So mm -hmm. these conditions are not satisfied in Syria. They're not satisfied, of course, in many other countries. That's why we, we keep hearing about the larger number of Syrian refugees. Unfortunately, Ray, that the United Nations and other countries are not treating the root cause of the problems, but they are treating the symptoms with Band-Aids. Yeah, that's when I think of the word refugee, maybe, I don't know, I'm from the Middle East. I think of the Middle East. There's so many refugees from the Middle East for so many years. It's like my whole life has been one of the first words you learn as a middle person from the Middle East is the word refugee. It seems like it's an ongoing challenge that doesn't get properly addressed. But let's turn to the U.S., I mean, I think you said, what, about 7,000 refugees? 25,000 uh, Syrian refugees. 25,000. Yeah. But I think you posted that just this year, it was only like 6,000 of those came just yeah. this year. That's nothing. Yes, yeah, so 3,500 compared, of course. And let's just put into things into perspective. Yeah. Uh, President Biden, uh, after one week of war in Ukraine, he said we will be welcoming 100,000 Ukrainian refugees to the United States, 100,000. It took five years for the Obama, Obama administration to welcome the first Syrian refugees. The Trump administration uh, had their refugee ban or Muslim ban or whatever you want to call it, where they prevented any resettlement of Syrian refugees, of course, and other refugees from the Middle East. Um, and then the Biden administration, in spite of their pledges, to uh, rectify the policies of the Trump administration. They were very slow, still very slow, in resettling Syrian refugees. Uh, and so far, they settled about 3,500. Um, there are many reasons for that. Of course, the Afghan uh, pullout from of the U US pullout from Afghanistan um, has kind of distracted the administration. So they had to welcome about 100,000 Afghani refugees, then the Ukraine war happened. But that is not an excuse for the 29,000 Syrian refugees who were vetted already. And they went through long process with multiple um, entities in the US government checking everything about them. And they were told five years ago that they are ready to come to the US, to Chicago and other places. And they're still lingering in refugee camps. So they've approved about 29,000 29, Syrian refugees to come here, and over five years they haven't let them in yet? Exactly. But you know what, what you said that really surprised me was they brought in 100,000 Afghan refugees. They brought in 100,000 Ukraine refugees. This didn't take years. What is it about the Middle East or Syrian refugees? Why didn't they take in 100,000 Syrian refugees right away? Is there uh, some... Well uh, well, I mean, I have my own theories, but I think you agree with me that when yeah. there is a political will to do something, yeah. they, you know, the administration can do something, right? I mean, yeah. this is the most powerful country in the world. If President Biden or the people around him decided that, you know, we, we really made mistakes in Syria, we messed it up, like Iraq and other places, and we are part of the problem that what's happening right now in Syria and let's try to make it a priority. Priority means not the first priority, climate change and China, not the second prior priority, which is Russia and Ukraine, but maybe third priority. Um, and let's look at this issue as a moral issue that we are responsible for it. They would have settled much faster, Syrian refugees. But the problem is that this is not a priority to the administration. You don't see Syria in the news. 
even though that you have Syrians slaughtered every day. We have just a few days ago, a cholera outbreak in Syria, cholera outbreak in Syria, which did not happen since 2009. The last time that we had a small outbreak in Syria was 2000. This is big news. And a country that is middle class, that has reasonable healthcare um, system, and now you have cholera outbreak, uh, you know, outbreak, and you don't hear it in the news here, that means Syria is out of the way. When people don't talk about Syria, when the media doesn't talk about Syria, the administration say, okay, we can leave it as, as, as long as it's contained in that part of the Middle East. Of course, uh, the, the problem with the administration and previous administration, when they look at the Middle East, they look at it from two prisms or three maybe. The first one is Israel. What's the national interest of Israel? Is that helpful or not helpful to Israel? So that's the, the main goal of any American administration, unfortunately. The second thing, is there any oil um, that we can gain from? In Syria, there is not much oil or gas. Um, and the third thing, thing is terrorism. Um, and the problem that many organizations since 9-11, or oh, not administrations, they look at the Middle East through the prism of terrorists. And if you're from the Middle East, they look at you as a threat, not as an asset. Many of the Syrian refugees, almost all of the Syrian refugees who came to Europe are functioning, going through education, learning the language quickly, like Palestinian refugees in the U.S. and other places. They are productive part of the society. They have small businesses. Right. They want to succeed. They succeed. They improve the economy. But the problem that this administration, previous administration, they do not look at people who come from the Middle East as assets, but they look at them as liability and threat. And that's why it's they don't welcome them the way that the, the same way they welcome Ukrainians. I was surprised though that uh, Obama took so long to do something six years to help the Syrian refugees too. It it sounds like as you pointed out that there are problems in this country, especially when it comes to Middle East refugees. Um, president Obama has the opportunity had the opportunity to be the best president when it comes to policies in the in the Middle East and initially in his term. He gave yeah. uh, speeches, I mean, you're, you're aware of that, that, oh, yeah. well, people thought that this is something different. You know, this administration is different. They look at the Middle East as um, a place that people um, need freedom and democratic changes and aspirations. And we look at them as normal people. He, he, he actually humanized the people in the Middle East. My son, Adham, told me this is the first time I feel that I'm American. He was born here in this country because President Obama's early rhetoric were very inclusive. Yeah. Um, but then he missed it up. He missed it up really bad in, in Syria. Um, we had this um, horrible civil war where you had, you know, the worst refugee crisis. We had people drowning in the Mediterranean, uh, including the, the kid, Ayran Kurdi, who you probably remember, everyone remembers, yes. the Syrian kid who had drowned in the Mediterranean. But that was one out of thousands of Syrian refugees who drowned in the Mediterranean trying to flee from Syria to Greek and, and Europe. We had chemical weapons used more than 300 times. Everyone remembers the red line of President Obama that, you know, if you use medical uh, chemical right. weapons, we will punish you. And then Assad used chemical weapons, nothing, nothing happened. And that created this floodgate of refugees in Europe that destabilized Europe, destabilized the whole world, created terrorism, ISIS, and of course, and all, everything. And he had a chance to uh, to correct this policy, but he did not. Michelle Obama, by the way, you know, every president uh, espoused usually when there's a major issue in the world, they speak about that. Right. She never mentioned Syria. She never mentioned Syrian refugees. They did not humanize the Syrian refugees. The way that we are seeing now Ukrainian refugees and victims of war are humanized in every media outlet where you have CNN and Fox News and ABC and NBC and CBC going to Ukraine and talking right. about the kids, which is right. This is right. This is the right way to, to do it. But in Syria, Syrians were not, human, not humanized. The same thing with Palestine, of course. I mean, this is not unique to Syria. Right. When it comes to the Middle East, we treat them different way than any if, other country in the world. If, if there's no platform to talk about these issues, because you, you're right. I remember hearing Obama for the first time going, wow. This is the first time I feel like somebody actually is going to do something and care. And that made it worse when nothing got done. The worst thing to do is to raise up your hopes because you just fall further. 
Um, sometimes it's better to have somebody that doesn't do anything. Of course, it's never good to have anybody not do anything, but the, in terms of expectations. Um, but you're right. The point you make, I think, is so important. If the world uh, platforms, the soapboxes, are not talking about us, the Syrian refugees, the uh, refugees in general, they're not going to get any attention. The biggest one, as you know, is taking place this week in the United Nations. Is there a strong voice in the United Nations? I knew the I know the UNSCR is the the mechanism to deal with this, but are refugees getting a strong voice spotlight from the UN, or does the UN need to do more? Um, uh, I think also. I mean, I think just to put things into perspective, sure. when we talk about refugees, we also talk about displaced people. So um, displaced people are the ones who were displaced within their own countries. Ah, okay. uh, refugees are the ones who basically pushed out of their countries. Okay. So there's about 85 million displaced people in, uh, in wow. the world, including wow. 26 million refugees. And most of the people who are displaced are in the Middle East, you know, including Syria and other places. Um, and also to, for our Arabic audience, you know, um, it took 70 years of war with Israel to have 6.5 Palestinian refugees. It took six years to have 6.5 million Syrian refugees. So that will give you the scale of brutality between right. Arab regimes and Israel, which is considered the eternal war, you know, enemy of everyone in the Middle East. Um, uh, but the UN has been trying to become, or became actually, unfortunately, um, an aid organization. It's a big aid organization where countries pour money um, in their uh, WHO, the World Health uh, uh, Health Organization, UNHCR, UN OCHA, um, World Food Program, um, other uh, UN agencies, and these agencies provide aid to the refugees and displaced people. Um, they're doing reasonable work. I mean, without that, people would have uh, died of out of hunger um, and uh, froze to death more than what's happening right now. We still have people dying out of malnutrition and fr freezing to death in Syria and Yemen, other places. Um, but without the UN, you know, many um, uh, hundreds of thousands of people would have suffered. Um, in this UN uh, UNGA week, uh, there are some strong voices in support of the Syrian refugees in general, including uh, the president of Turkey, uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, although there's question marks about his politics and right. policies and things like that. The, em the Emir of Qatar, uh, actually one, one of the best speeches about Syria came from the Emir of Qatar. He, he talked about the moral responsibility of the UN and the fact that we forgot about Syria and we forgot about the Syrian refugees. It was very inspiring speech. Um, but other than these two, I don't see any um, world leader who speak or hint to the Syrian refugees. There's always some rhetoric about Syria. In the past, it used, used to be much more powerful, even including the U.S. president. Nowadays, they don't even mention Syria. They want to forget about Syria. Um, uh, right now, there's a looming crisis in Syria related to the U.N. aid that used to be coming through the border from Turkey, which serves an area in Syria, in northwest Syria, that has about 4.2 million people. All of them are displaced from other parts of Syria. 1.2 million of them live in tents, in camps, um, and they are dependent on the aid coming across the border from Turkey because they are under the control of the rebels or opposition in Syria. So they're the government, actually, they're like separate entity from Syria, like Gaza, basically, um, under siege, and they are dependent on, on, on aid. And Russia has threatened multiple times to stop this aid coming from the um, uh, from across the border, uh, cross-border relief. Uh, the UN uh, Security Council renew this aid every six months, and Russia said, this is the last time I'm going to renew it. So in the winter, that means in January, most likely Russia will say, uh, I will veto any renewal, especially with the war ha now happening in Ukraine and and um, you know, in a massive between Russia and, and so the, the US. So the Syrian refugees get caught up in the world conflict. They're used as pawns, basically. It's like, I'm not going to do this because there's some other agenda that some country wants. Um, is there is there more that the UN could do? Is there something more? Because you're right, the more voices puts a spotlight and that encourages the media then. And as the media reports on it, then awareness becomes greater. But the awareness level seems very low at this time. 
Uh, definitely. I mean, the, the, one of the main responsibilities of the UN is to uh, make sure that there are peace in the world. Uh, we, yeah. we, we're not hearing any more about UN peace troops in Syria. Um, the responsibility to protect civilians from the brutality of their own governments is also one of the um, responsibilities of the UN. We're not hearing about this responsibility to protect civilians. We're talking about one million people killed in a matter of 11 years. 100,000 people disappeared under torture um, in the prisons. Chemical weapons used more than 300 times. Uh, siege, siege has been used. Hospitals were bombed and so forth. So, And the third thing is uh, this system in the United Nations Security Council that one country can derail every good work that the UN can do, whether it's Russia or the yeah. United States or China, you know, and, and, and this is a problem. Unless yeah. this system is rectified, nothing will happen. We've seen the Secretary General of the UN recently in Kiev, right? Uh, his picture is greeting the, uh, the president of Ukraine. He never went to the Syrian border. He never met with refugees and made this big deal about this issue. Right. It's his responsibility to respond to the crisis, and he's not doing his job when it comes to Syria. So the UN has fallen short a little bit then, I think. All right. Definitely. Dr. Sahlul, I, you know, I, 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 on one hand, it's so good to have you on there to tell us, you know, really from a first hand, you're at the front line of this and we appreciate everything that you do. I mean, dedicating your life to this, um, you know, is so important. But every time we hear about the topic, it's uh, it's a little gloomy and sad, but maybe getting this out might inspire somebody to do more. But Dr. Sahlul, thank you so much for joining us this morning on radio to to update. It's always a pleasure to have you on. I invite you and your audience to listen to the good work that we're doing on the ground. We have a conference in Chicago uh, on November 18th and 19th uh, talking about what we are doing in Gaza and Syria and Ukraine and Colombia. I will, I will be there. I will. And tell us your website where people can get information. Uh, www.medglobal.org. We're also on Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, and we, Twitter. You and we it. could find out information about this conference coming up. I will be there. I promise you I will be there. Dr. Oh. Sahlul, my guest, thank you so much, everybody. We will talk to you again. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll uh, thank everybody for joining the show. Thank you so much, everybody. When you're looking for the best in optical care, Dr. Imad Nakash is your doctor to see. With years of experience and thousands of successful procedures performed, you can trust your eyes to Dr. Imad Nakash. See Dr. Imad Nakash and his professional staff for your eye care needs. There's two locations to serve you. In Hazel Park, call 248-336-3937. 248-336-3937. In Rochester Hills, call 248-299-3937. That's 248-299-3937. At Top Rehab Physical Therapy Clinic in Dearborn, we provide effective physical therapy sessions in order to limit pain and discomfort. Top Rehab provides physical therapy care for any diagnosis prescribed by a physician, and we regularly see and treat conditions such as stroke, TMJ, fibromyalgia, sciatica, joint pain, and more. We use a variety of pain management methods, including modalities, soft tissue mobilization, and therapeutic exercise. If you're in need of physical rehabilitation or physical physical therapy, get the highest quality health care at Top Rehab. Most insurance is accepted and we're open Monday, Wednesday, and Friday 8 to 6, Tuesday and Thursday 8 to 5, and Saturday 10 till 2. Call for an appointment today at 313-846-0555. That's 313-846-0555. Choose Top Rehab Physical Therapy Clinic on Michigan Avenue in Dearborn. Life's too short to be in pain. And I want to thank all of you for listening to our radio show uh, next week. Is we're going to be taking our season break uh, until the spring. And I know I'm going to miss everybody here at WNZK, WDMV, and 1080 AM in Chicago. Um, but uh, I want to thank all our guests who joined us today and uh, who uh, uh, helped us understand some of the challenges facing the UN. I'm Ray Hanania. We'll see you at our final show next week. September 28th. Have a great week. Bye-bye, everybody.